from the Department of Communication and also has a position in the Department of the uh, SPS Studies in Cornell University, and uh, that's in Ithaca, New York. He's very interested in the history of uh, public understanding of science and science communication, but also interested in other fields of science communication, like the informal science education. Um, I know Professor Lovitz since 2004, um, since we met in a conference about this subject, and I spent one year with him last year, in Cornell, and I learned a lot of things there, but what I didn't learn until this morning is that his family held the first falafel shop in Palo Alto, California, <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm looking forward to learning many more things today. Toda. Shalom, slicha ki ani lo medaber enivrit, beivrit. Sorry, that's about as much Hebrew as I can handle uh, for the moment. Thank you very much uh, to Ayelet for inviting me uh, to the Fulbright system, the U.S. Fulbright system, for paying for me to be here, um, uh, and to all of, all of you for coming. Uh, as Ayelet said, uh, my, uh, my mother started the first falafel shop in Palo Alto, California, uh, just a year or two after we came to... Uh, um, to Haifa uh, in 1968, <laughs> um, and that was the last time I was in Haifa, so it, it, it's been a while. I'm from California, we, and within the United States, we like to say that those of us from California have no accent. Everybody else has an accent, not us. If I start speaking too fast, if my English is hard to understand, um, please uh, stop me. Uh, as I had said, I, my, my central topic is uh, the history of public understanding of science. But I've had a bunch of other uh, activities, including being the editor of a journal and uh, helping start a society that have led me to pay a lot more attention to the rest, uh, to the whole field of science communication. And that has led me often to talking with scientists about why it might be important to, uh, to communicate. And so that's the topic that I really want to talk about today. And when I say what you should care, I'm going to assume for the moment that most of you have a connection to the science community and that that's the world really that we're talking about. So what is this topic, this topic of public understanding of science? In English and in other languages, it goes by many, many names. So in English, it's, uh, when I started in the field, it was public understanding of science. The abbreviation for that is PUS. And if you know English, PUS is what happens when you have an infection and something comes out of your arm. So that's not a very good abbreviation. Some people in recent years have been calling it public engagement in science and technology. That's PEST. It's like a bug that bites you. Also not very good. Um, I like to call it public communication of science and technology, impossible to make a word out of. Uh, one of my colleagues calls it public learning and understanding of science, plus, moving up, that's good. Uh, as you can see, I ran out of room. I started putting all the other words there that it goes by. Some people call it science literacy or science communication. Uh, scientific temper is a word that's used in India. It's actually written into the Indian Constitution that it is the duty of every citizen to develop a scientific temper. Uh, in uh, funding organizations, refer to informal science education. Science popularization is another term. In China, there is a national law of science popularization requiring that this be done. Uh, in other languages, vulgarization and French or divulgacion in, in Spanish, both of which have a notion of disseminating or distributing information. Each of these terms in each of the languages has a slightly different set of meanings. I'm not going to worry too much about those differences. I'm talking about the whole field um, as we go. Why should you care? Well, I can tell you that the leaders of the scientific community care. Um, so that's at least a place to start. 
if you look in many scientific journals, there will be editorials talking about the importance of communicating with the public, about the importance of public engagement, um, about the importance of training scientists on how to do outreach. It's what it's sometimes called, doing outreach. Uh, I think it says on the poster announcing this talk, we'll be doing a workshop like that next week. Um, uh, Science magazine, or this was Nature magazine, public engagement. Uh, SciDev.net is a, a website that serves developing countries. Uh, and the, the rationale is always there are many public needs that scientists are uniquely capable of addressing and scientists need to be participating in those public discussions and responding to public needs. Universities have created chairs of, prof of public understanding of science. This is my colleague Ilan Chabai, uh, who's an American who was working in Sweden in a chair. Uh, this is somebody in uh, Bristol. This is also in the UK, uh, the Simonyi Professorship. Uh, there are, so there are, there are large institutions and donors who, have, who think that this is an important field. Um, another reason why people tend to think that this is an important issue is they look at some data about what people know about science. So this is comparative data looking at Europe, US, China, South Korea, Japan, and Malaysia, mostly from about 10, 8 or 10 years ago, but there's some variation. And it, what it shows is that people are very interested in science and technology. So new scientific discoveries, if you look in the US or China, 70% are interested in the new discoveries, maybe only about 50% in some of the other countries. New inventions, again, you see these very high numbers, um, Europe a little farther behind. New medical discoveries, the US is up at 80%. Um, everybody else is in 60%. Invi concern about environmental pollution. Some of these other countries, South Korea and Japan are quite high. Uh, space exploration, less, a little bit less interest. The, that question didn't get asked in Europe or um, uh, South Korea, I think. Um, but in general, you see there's these high levels of interest. However, despite these high levels of interest, what you see is that people are also continuing to believe in things that most scientists, 99.9% .9 of scientists would say are not scientific. So paranormal uh, or ESP, extrasensory uh, uh, perception. Um, this is United States data over a 15 year period from 1990 to 2005. Something like 50% dropped to 40% believe in extrasensory perception. Something like 40% believe that houses can be haunted, can have ghosts in them. Um, 35% think that people can communicate between their minds directly. 20% um, believe in witches. Um, uh, and um, yeah, all of those, you see that. This is, the other re this is another reason why people worry. This photograph, this will work better if we have the lights down. Can we turn off all the lights? Which ones? Um, We'll be, be able to see just a little better. Um, this is another reason. This is one of the photographs from the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, came out 10 or 15 years ago. It's called the Eagle Nebula. It's one of the most beautiful photos taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. And when it first came out, NASA did a very good job of distributing the image. And it appeared in newspapers and it appeared on television. And CNN showed the picture for about 30 seconds and talked about all the wonderful things that come out of NASA. And within a few hours, CNN was getting phone calls and early internet bulletin boards were getting postings talking about uh, the image of Jesus Christ that is in this photograph. I'm sure you can all see it. 
I'm in the Holy Land and you can't find Jesus Christ? Okay, let me, let me enlarge the part of the photograph that has Jesus Christ in it. Okay, let me at least orient it correctly to make it a little bit easier for you to find. Okay, okay so here's, here's a picture of him. So here's his hand reaching out. There's his face right there. <laughs> what does it mean when this image that is that is the, the peak of what modern science and technology can produce, when it's on television for 30 seconds, people, in, this is what people saw, was the image of Jesus Christ. This is why scientists start getting worried about what does the public know, and what does the pu public believe, and what responsibility do scientists have to address this problem. There are more contemporary kinds of issues uh, that come up. So some of you may know that our former president, George Bush, was not known for his respect for modern science. Um, he was a strong supporter of teaching uh, creationism, anti-evolution in schools. Uh, he did not strong, he did not, apparently did not believe in uh, global climate change caused by humans um, and so forth. Uh, so they worry about that. They worry about reactions to genetically modified food, where people call GMOs frankenfood. And, and you can buy your frankenfood frozen dinner, which has been genetically modified, um, box-raised tortured chicken, um, microwavable for added carcinogens, um, things like that. Or even as recently as the triple disaster in Japan, the earthquake, uh, tsunami, and radiation leak. I mean, here's a you know, very contemporary kinds of issue, which the rea public reaction to it very much depends on what people know about radiation and about earthquake dangers and so forth, and how should people respond to that uh, problem. That's the kind of issue. High technology, like nanotechnology, that can produce little chips that uh, can be tremendously valuable for dealing with personalized medicine. We'll have all of your, you know, ro roaming around in your blood, testing you, but also raise privacy issues. So this man is coming into the drugstore, the pharmacy, um, and the clerk has already read his little chip that tells that he's going for an embarrassing kind of medicine, um, and she announces it to the whole world. Is there too much... Um, publicity. It's for reasons like that that the scientific community worries about public understanding of science and thinks that maybe that it ought to do something about it. And as a result, the scientific community has done many things to, has initiated lots of activities, many countries around the world, including here, I've heard, uh, many places. Some of them are the formal science education. We should just be educating everybody in science. But that reaches only a very small part of the public. Uh, people are in school for six, seven hours a day from the time they're five until 18. Before five, before school, after school, after you graduate school, all the rest of your life, you're learning new things. And so for that, you need to use other kinds of ways to reach people, and you can use uh, various kinds of science outreach, going lab days where people come into the lab, where you go out to the shopping mall and, and demonstrate things, you go to school visits. Uh, there can be whole institutions devoted to outreach, like science museums, like the Madatech here, or the Bloomfield Science Museum in Jerusalem. Uh, and you can have science in the media, both journalism, that is reporting about news, uh, either in short form in newspapers, magazines, television news, or in longer form, magazines, documentaries, and so forth. But you also have science in lots of other kinds of media. It shows up in movies and video games and so forth. So just to show some examples of those kinds of things, to give a, a feel for the variety, um, these are things just from my own university uh, uh, at Cornell. Uh, this is a press release, um, 
some, phys some physics finding uh, here, issued as a press release, picked up by some of the technical media, uh, didn't run, didn't do much, didn't appear very much in general newspapers. We have a, a radio, commercial radio production company in Ithaca in our town that works with scientists to produce shows on animal instincts, the environment, microbe world, one minute, little one minute stories about microbiology that get distributed all over the country um, and run in between programs. Uh, one of our research centers, the Material, Cornell Center for Materials Research, has, does these kinds of outreach programs where f students will go work with kids at the public library or uh, places like that. A whole range of activities and of course it takes resources to support those activities. You have to have commitment from the deans and the presidents and so forth um, to provide funding for that. Science shows up on television in a variety of ways. Uh, did the show numbers come to, some people are nodding their heads, okay, so this was a show um, in which uh, these guys were mathematicians. Or one, of them, one of them was a detective and his brother was a mathematician, probably at Caltech, so as close to the Technion as we can get, not quite as good, but, um, and um, solved all of their detective mysteries uh, using mathematics. And they had real mathematicians as consultants on this program uh, to try to make sure that the math was as accurate as possible. Uh, the Big Bang Theory, interestingly, has that come here? Yeah, yeah. I've still not seen it. I need to, I need to see it. Um, I didn't hear about it until I had gone to China last year and somebody told me about it. Um, movies that deal with science. So Armageddon and Deep Impact, which both dealt with the possibility of asteroid strikes uh, on the planet, uh, near-Earth objects, the scientists call them, and actually, as a result of the movies, led to funding for further study of, uh, of near-Earth objects. And there's actually quite a few examples that we can find where scientists who worked as consultants helping with these movies, uh, that one of the payback things is that that, would have, that affected funding for that area of research. Sometimes uh, scientists, there was one example of scientists consulted on the movie Twister, which is about tornadoes, and there was some kind of instrument that got shown in the movie that doesn't really exist. It was um, a, a new kind of instrument, but they needed it for the storyline, so they created it for the movie. And the scientists who watched the movie said, that's a good idea we should make an instrument like that. And so it became a stimulation for scientific development. Avatar, which had the, such an environmental uh, message and which has led uh, James Cameron, the, the director, to devote a lot of resources to talking about environmental awareness. These things, there's this interaction that takes place uh, when you have stuff in the media. The movie Day After Tomorrow, uh, which came out four or five years, no, six or seven years ago now, um, uh, about global climate change. Even though the scenario in it was, was impossible, the very pre presentation of the idea of uh, such dramatic climate change was used by scientists as a stimulus for public discussions. They would have public meetings to talk about, um, about the possibilities of climate change. And there's research to show that people who saw the movie had a continuing interest in climate change and in seeking out information about climate change over time. Obviously, Al Gore's movie, Inconvenient Truth, also about climate change, lead, which led eventually uh, to him sharing the Nobel Prize, uh, Peace Prize with the, um, the IPCC, the committee that does the studies of science change. As far as I know, that's the only Nobel Prize for science communication um, that we've had. There are websites often targeted to trying to reach diverse audiences. Um, this one is called Sci Girls. It's especially stories for girls. You have games about science. This is something that would run on a Nintendo. Um, there are many, many more games, uh, so forth. So all the different media get used. And they all get used 
in the uh, in the service of what many scientists are calling public engagement. And there are at least two different meanings of public engagement. And the first meaning is the idea of let's just get people excited, engaged in science. Let's get learners engaged. Um, so you have demonstrations at, at universities or fairs where somebody pours chemicals together and there are explosions and, and kids get excited, just generating excitement. You have science museums where kids can, or anybody, can interact with the science. So this giant bubble machine at the Exploratorium in San Francisco, which is one of the great science museums. Increasingly around the world, you have science festivals. Many cities now have a week or 10 days when there will be a whole series of lectures at several places around the city. And maybe for a couple of days, there will be a street fair with outreach booths and with uh, activities and so forth. This particular one is from Cambridge, Massachusetts, where Harvard and MIT are. It was actually created by a colleague of mine who used to be in the UK, and he moved to the MIT Museum and used that opportunity to help create this. So these things are, and they actually, the science festival world had its first international conference just uh, six months ago uh, in the US. This is a, there's a growing movement here about these things. Of course, another kind of engagement is science journalism, looking at all the different stories that I said that, that appear. This is from earlier this week. I went to the New York Times website, Google News website, Yahoo News. Um, computers are smart. It knew, uh, it knew that I was uh, uh, in Israel and, and gave, me, gave me the ads in Hebrew. Um, you know, the kinds of stories uh, that are there. Um, about, there are stories about plastic bags, about the politics of um, uh, running uh, nuclear, nuclear regulation in the U.S., stories about technology, about Apple, and, uh, and so forth, stories about the E. coli outbreak in Germany, um, all these different things that give you um, uh, a range of stories that people are interested in. The other kind of public engagement, not just being excited and not just getting information, is actually getting people active in some part of the scientific process in various ways. So having a public meeting, let's say you're trying to design a new water treatment plant for your community and there's a discussion about where it should go and what trade-offs there should be about size and location and so forth. And um, so you bring people from the community together so that they have a say in what kinds of decisions will get made. We, the, especially those of us who live in democracies, believe that everybody should be able to participate in a public discussion. And so this kind of public engagement is about talking about the risks of nanotechnology or the risks of GMOs. There's a famous example in the late uh, 1970s in Cambridge, Massachusetts, location of Harvard and MIT, as I said, where it was just as biotechnology was beginning in our modern forms, and the city of Cambridge wanted to outlaw the use of biotechnology of recombinant DNA in the city of Cambridge. There were many researchers at Harvard and MIT who were not happy about this possibility. And this led to a whole series of public meetings and public discussions in which the scientists presented what they, why they thought this would be safe, and some critics, including some scientists, explained what they thought the dangers were, and eventually a series of regulations was developed that met people's concerns, and um, it went forward. That's a political engagement, which is also part of what goes on. Then there are kinds of engagement that bring these together. There's a whole field called citizen science, in which you have ordinary citizens out gathering data to, that becomes the scientific database that scientists use to do their analysis. Sometimes you do that because you have a project, you're trying to understand bird distribution across the continent. That's, that requires more data than a professor and six graduate students can collect. But if you can recruit thousands of people to observe their birdhouses and send in their data or observe their yards, 
you can get very good and very robust data. Um, and so you can solve a scientific problem. It also slides into this political engagement because if there's, again, let's say a water quality pro problem in a particular area, people, citizens can learn how to monitor the water and see if the problem is getting better or worse or where some of the potential is. Another kind of engagement, especially for scientists, is directly in the political system, right? To testify to, in my country, uh, the Congress, here to the Knesset. Um, uh, I had the honor of meeting your science minister the other day. Um, you know, this, having someone who I guess is from the Technion, is that right? Um, uh, uh, you know, where scientists are directly engaged in the political process. Um, some scientists are able to combine that very well with their, um, with their scientific role. This is a geneticist at Harvard um, whose the subtitle down here is a social activist in science. He was very explicit about using his science to try to um, uh, make the world a better place. Even though he was doing molecular biology, he also felt that he had to do more than his lab work. He had to do something where he was reaching out to the public. This is an example which shows, however, that there are risks. This is James Watson, one of the co-discoverers of the structure of DNA, and uh, who's now about 80, in his early 80s, and for his entire life has been extremely outspoken. He's not someone who controls what he says very well. And sometimes he says things that he wishes he had not said. Most recently, he, was, he had essentially given up all of his positions, but he still had an honorary position. And he made some remarks that were widely interpreted as being racist, um, as being uh, really quite insensitive to some of the racial issues in society. They were so inflammatory that he lost even his last honorary positions. And so this man, who was one of the great scientists of the 20th century, ended his career um, really in not su such a nice way. Um, and so that begins to point to the fact that although I have been talking about all these things, there's all these opportunities, there's all these ways of going about it, there are some potential risks. So let's talk a little bit about these risks and benefits for scientists, because if we remember my opening question, why should you care, right? So what are the risks? So there are usually two risks that scientists worry about. The first one is, especially if they're working with a journalist or they're trying to help create a museum, will it be accurate? Will the, the shorter version capture the essence of my science? Um, and that is a problem. Most of the studies, especially of journalism, have shown that the problem ends up being mostly about um, things that get left out. You didn't give the names of all my co-authors. You didn't list all of the reagents. That's true. Um, but that's because you can't tell everything all the time in order to tell the story. Another concern is the problem of, of that your peers, other scientists, might disapprove. You know, why are you spending time talking to the public? Why aren't you in the lab doing your work? A uh, famous story that the astronomer Carl Sagan, who was who you'll see a picture of in a minute, uh, was, um, who was a very active popularizer. He was proposed for membership in the uh, National Academy of Science, and he was voted down. He was not given entry to the National Academy of Sciences, and it's widely believed that it was because there were people who disapproved of the amount of popular uh, communication that he did. On the other hand, there are some clear personal benefits to, to doing outreach. The first one is many people, many scientists who do this talk about a sense of satisfaction. I think they're receiving funding from the public and it's their duty to, to respond and in fact they discover that it's satisfying to, to talk to the public. Um, it's nice to find out that people are interested in what you do. And so when you're able to talk about it, um, that turns out to be very nice. 
A second reason is that it does lead to recognition of uh, your, your name gets to be known uh, by the public, by your employer. If you work for a large organization and you get quoted in the media, the president knows who you are. Right? And that, that can be helpful sometimes. Um, and sometimes political recognition, that you, know, you are an important person, your, your work um, is useful and is making a contribution to an important issue. It also turns out that not only is th there is the potentially this peer disapproval, but it also turns out that a benefit is that your peers will know, your other scientists will know you better and know you and likely um, respond well if you have appeared in the media. This is, this is a fairly complicated graph. Don't worry if you don't get it all. I'll try to explain the key points. Um, this is data that was, it was published about 20 years ago. And it was a wonderful natural experiment where the New York Times covers science uh, regularly. And there was about a four month period when the New York Times was on strike and was not publishing. But the editors continued to publish an internal newspaper just so they could tell what they would have covered if they had been publishing. So we have uh, this nice set of articles that would have been covered but didn't actually appear in the public. And it turns, and then they compared that data to every science story that appeared in the next year, in 1979. And what this difference shows between the control groups and the study groups is that those articles that were uh, actually published and that readers actually saw were more likely by about 70 percent more to get cited in the scientific literature in the next 10 years than the articles that were not covered by the New York Times. And because of the way the experiment is designed, you can exclude the possibility that it was just because they were better articles. It's specifically because they, were, they appeared in public that they received more citations. So there's a lot of evidence there's there, and that study has been duplicated um, by others as well. Um, so it's good for scientists, for individual scientists, to appear in the media, to be out there in public. There are institutional benefits of uh, appearing in the media uh, or doing outreach. Some of them are financial. Uh, you get more people willing to donate money to you. You get more politicians willing to to fund your research. Uh, if there's a time of stress, there's a, an accident on your campus or there's a, a nuclear issue someplace else and people are worried about scientists, you've already built up relationships with them and so you already have the ability to have conversations with them. Uh, politically, especially if you're asking for a big facility, you want to build um, a large environmental project or you want to um, uh, build a nuclear facility, if you have, as an institution, if you have established good relationships with publics, you will have a better chance of getting those resources. There's a recruiting benefit to science as well. So not, not just the institution as in the institution of the Technion or the institution of the University of Haifa, but the institution of science as a group. The more people who are out there learning about science, the more people who will potentially be interested in becoming scientists or potentially interested in coming to your institution. Um, a couple of days ago I gave a talk at Ben-Gurion University uh, in Beersheba and we were talking with one of the faculty members who talked a lot about the image of the university and why that made her want to be a faculty member there um, and some of the public uh, meanings there. And obviously you want students to know about you. They, you want them, the best students, to have heard about you and to be willing to come to your institution. And there are a lot of scientists who, um, uh, who, for whom this is an explicit reason why they engage in public outreach. So Carl Sagan, who was an astronomer at Cornell, uh, he was still there when I first started teaching there, although he died a few years later, um, was very explicit. How many of you have seen Cosmos? his television series, a few, only a few, okay. Um, this, was a, this was a 
television series that appeared in 1980 and has continues to be available on DVD today. There was a book associated with it, all about the universe. And Sagan was explicit. The reason he produced that, one of the major reasons he produced that, was to get young people excited about science. And if you talk to young, especially astronomers, but many young scientists between the ages of about 30 and 50 today, they will tell you they became a scientist because they saw cosmos, and it got them excited. Same thing is true of uh, Bill Nye. Um, I use him because he's a, an alumnus of our university, um, and he comes back and visits and talks to my classes. Um, Bill Nye the Science Guy, did his show make it to Israel? No. So he's, he's an engineer, um, just a bachelor's level engineer, uh, who's also a stand-up comedian, and ended up making a comedy act called Bill Nye the Science Guy. Uh, and then he ended up making a children's television series, which ran 15 years ago and is still in reruns um, and is still very widely seen. And again, if I, talk to my, if I talk to my students at Cornell, why did you want to become a scientist? Many of them will say, I saw Bill Nye the Science Guy. It made me want to be a scientist. This is Lisa Randall. She's a physicist at Harvard um, who has done not really big popular things, but she's written some popular books and she's quoted in the media. And she's explicit that part of why she's doing it is because she's a female physicist at Harvard. And she wants to make sure that women know that they can be female, that they can be physicists at Harvard. If that's the, the peak um, of the career, she's made it there and she wants other women to know that it's possible. So she's setting an example. She's trying to recruit as well. Those are, those are the personal benefits. Um, there are societal benefits. Um, those societal benefits are um, uh, usually divided into three categories. Practical science literacy. The more pe people need science for their everyday lives, whether it's to make decisions about vaccines or um, other fields. I'm going to go through each of these in more detail. Um, civic science literacy, solar power, where again you have to make these, these community decisions, and then cultural science literacy. So what's practical science literacy? This is, um, you need to know science in order to use your computer, to know what kinds of questions to ask your mechanic, uh, which medicines to take. If you're trying to do an organic garden, you need to know something about chemicals. There are, there's a whole new cookbook just came out, um, published by the, produced by one of, the, co one of the, the former chief scientist of Microsoft, entirely about the science of cooking. Um, you probably can't read it. Um, this cartoon says um, he's trying to fix the car. It's your computer. I'll have to call the systems analyst um, uh, to fix it. So that's, there's all these practical reasons why it's useful to know some science and technology. Civic science literacy. These are the issues which, for us in a democracy, we are constantly having to ask, make votes, tell our legislators, our members of parliament, what we care about, whether it's about climate change or energy conservation. Do we want more regulations on our cars? Uh, in the US, we have these fuel standards about you have to have a certain level of fuel economy, sustainability issues, stem cells. Um, biotechnology, evolution, you know, the list is huge of things where we as a society have to make decisions. And those decisions involve science. And if scientists have not been active in helping the public understand those issues, the public will make decisions that scientists may not be happy with. So there's a uh, direct uh, implication for that. Oftentimes, people talk about science literacy just in terms of practical and civic. And I think it's really important that we remember the cultural science literacy as well. Why do we think people should know something about science? Because science is one of the supreme achievements of the human mind. We should know about science because it's beautiful. Right? And whether we think it's beautiful because a mathematical structure is just an amazing piece of symmetry and construction, or whether it's because to understand the structure of the eye is about understanding the amazing complexity of the human body and, and our ability to understand it, 
it's like music. It's like art. How can we be fully human if we don't uh, understand this thing that the human mind is able to achieve? An understanding of mathematics, an understanding of the human body. So, um, to try to conclude, why should you care about public understanding of science? I think you should care partly because the leaders of your community, the people who have spent a lot of time trying to interact with publics and so on, have decided that it matters. And they've established these professorships and they write editorials and so forth. I think it's good for you as individual scientists. I think there's benefit to scientists for uh, uh, ultimate, there are risks, but I think ultimately there are more benefits. Um, and it's good for society, both for individuals and for our civic society, um, for democracies especially, um, and for us as humans. Another way to make this point. This is dinosaur knowledge over the course of a life. So you are born. And at about age two, you begin to learn the names of T-Rex and Stegosaurus. And at age five or six, you are a dinosaur expert. You know the names of all dinosaurs and all of their interrelationships and who eats what and so forth. And by the time you're 10, you've forgotten it all. When you are 30, there's a brief peak. Why? Because you have kids, right? Somebody told me that in Israel I should push that to 35. Um, goes back down, and then there's another peak in your late 60s. When, you're a when, you're a grand, when you have grandparents, right? I showed this slide in a talk a couple days, yesterday, I guess, um, with uh, Ronan Mir from the Mata Tech Science Mu Director of the, of the Science Museum here. And what he said was, you know, here's what our goal is, is we don't want this, these three peaks. What we want is to have peaks and not have it go back down to zero. We want to try to keep this level up. That's the goal, is to have people know about dinosaurs all the time. So that's what we're trying to do. Tadarabha, this is a picture, this is my grandfather when he came to, the, to Israel, to Haifa, in 1962. And this is my distant cousin, Rami Berkowitz, who's a Technion graduate, sitting in the back. <laughs> Tadarabha. <laughs> <laughs> we have time for questions, I think. Okay. So, I'll start. Mm -hmm. First of all, thank you very much. I thought it was very interesting. Um, I agree with you totally about the, um, the importance of um, um, science in the media, and I think everybody here will agree also. But I did solve some problems, uh, especially with those popular films. Mm -hmm. um, they giving they give a very narrow uh, look at science and very manipulative. And I was wondering, that it, it, there is a possibility, possibility that it may give precisely the opposite effect that yeah. you want to achieve. I mean, if you see such a film as Armageddon or uh, The Day After Tomorrow, uh, science is very threatening. I mean, the people that are dealing there with science are very unique. Mm -hmm. So it's not for everybody. Those are very brave people. And they're actually manipulating nature with science. So you give a very specific picture of science. And you create a lot of misconceptions. That, does it really help? Yeah. So that, I mean, I think it's an important point, And it's something that many scientists worry about, which is if we don't give the whole picture or if we give a, dram a dramatic picture, does that end up creating more of a problem? turns out that most of the data shows, and there have now been quite a number of studies of people who go to these science movies, who watch these science movies, uh, that the effect is largely to increase their interest in science. Uh, as I said, like with Day After Tomorrow, that actually they remained interested in climate change. Uh, in some cases to recruit. Well, I could be an exciting astronaut, too, who could go to try to save the world. Um, that's an exciting thing for youth. Um, often that, uh, in the case, one of the most famous cases was Jurassic Park, where the uh, 
number of people who wanted to become paleontologists, even though the dinosaurs were very, and it looked like scientists had manipulated the dinosaurs to make them very dangerous, what it made was people wanted to become scientists to, to understand science. Um, there was, the same thing happens with television shows. Uh, in particular, there is now something called the CSI effect. In which CSI is the, the, you know, the television series with forensic science. And now the number of people trying to study forensic science has gone way up because people see it as exciting. Now, they sometimes get disappointed. It turns out not to be exactly what it, what it was, a, but they stay with it. And ultimately, um, uh, it's seen as a good thing. It causes some problems in courtrooms. Everybody expects DNA evidence, even when you're talking about a car crash that, <laughs> um, on a street corner. Um, but ultimately, what it's led to, many, most, most of the studies have shown, is higher levels of interest, um, higher levels of participation. And the actual factual things just fade away. A uh, former postdoc of mine, David Kirby, has just published a book, just came out, uh, called it's Hollywood Science documenting a lot of these a lot of these things and showing how often scientists serve as uh, consultants to movies uh, and have found very successful ways of helping shape movies so that even if the image is um, not what a scientist wishes it would be it ends up being something that's good for science itself so people don't remember really the details they don't yeah. Well, a, a, another example, I knew there was another example I had in my mind. Um, in the early days of nanotechnology, there were many, many scientists who were very worried about the image of nanotechnology. And Michael Crichton, who had written the book Jura and the movie Jurassic Park, wrote a book called Prey, in which nanotechnology goes crazy. There's these little pests, bugs that are created that are about to devour the world. Uh, and um, uh, and at the very end, somebody, somebody saves the world. And scientists were, were terrified that this would be the image of nanotechnology. When we started doing surveys of, and I was involved in some of these, surveys of public knowledge and attitudes about nanotechnology, it turned out that if you had read the book Prey, you were more likely to be interested in nanotechnology and, had the same, and were more likely to have a positive attitude. Just meant you were engaged. In the, in the topic. Mm -hmm. um, when you were talking about the, the reasons why the scientific community sees it as an emergency to, um, to educate the general community, mm -hmm. so one of the examples you cited was, was um, the CNN incident. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In science and nature, is that really a threat to science education, or is it maybe an opportunity to really, you know, you know, access different parts of the community and to, and to make it something that connects to different people? Uh, that's a really good question, um, and it's it's an area of big dispute within the field. There are um, there are some very active popularizers, Richard Dawkins who used to be the professor of public understanding of science at Cambridge, or no, at Oxford, which one was he at? Oxford. Oxford. Um, was one of the people who argued very strongly that if you truly understand science, then you must reject faith and religion. That you cannot, you, that these things are incompatible. Um, and he's a professor of public understanding of science. I mean, he was, so this was a very strong promotion. Um, and uh, there are others who, many others, who take the position that says, no, in fact, what is better is to be able to create opportunities for conversation between the fields. And um, a sociologist at Rice University in the United States named um, Elaine Howard Eklund, who happens to be a Cornell graduate, we're like the Technion, you know, we're all over the place. Um, uh, uh, 
recently published a book in which she showed that many scientists don't talk about their own religious faith because they believe that other scientists don't have religious faith and they're, they're, the social norm is to not talk about it because science is perceived as not being compatible with science. And yet in her survey, almost 50% of the scientists she talked to at elite universities, top universities, had some kind of religious faith. Um, and so one of the problems for talking about some of these issues is that we have created this, some of the very, very vocal people like Richard Dawkins have created this, this atmosphere where we believe you can't talk about science and religion in any, or science and faith or science and belief in any kind of productive way. And yet it turns out if we really look at the number of scientists who are, who in their personal lives are able to have that conversation, it turns out it's actually quite high. So this is actually a field where I think we're still trying to struggle with it. Um, so I may have pushed that particular image a little bit hard, but for the 50% of scientists who don't have faith, that is one of the, what they perceive as one of the real problems. So before we go on to our next question, uh, it's already 3.15, so those of you who plan to stay on until 3.15 uh, will say goodbye, thank you, and those of you who wish to stay with us and continue the discussion, are welcome. Um, <laughs> okay, Oni, you wanna? Um, it's my, uh, my own impression, I don't know, I'm right, but I have a feeling that in general in the media, the type of science communication is the thing that science say, say it's like a nice experiments, it's like fact, but there are at least two, I think, important aspects of science, which is like to doubt things, and another one is to base things of, on facts, which are not very commonly communicated. Mm -hmm. Is it just my own feeling, or is it really correct? The, um, I would say in general you're right that most of the stories that appear in the media and even many of the other kinds of outreach activities are about showing science as how it produces reliable knowledge, facts, but not so much how it creates a how it can be a, way, a tool for being skeptical and asking questions. Scientists will say that's what is a, a critical part of science, but in terms of what actually appears in the outreach, it's not so much. It's harder to show is one thing. But also, um, even in the case of media, it takes more work to write that kind of story. Uh, it takes more space, uh, it takes more time, which means more resources. And at least in the United States, that's become increasingly difficult uh, to do, is to find those resources. Um, but there are, I think many of us think that that is something that uh, could be done better, is in fact to show science in a richer sense of science as a way in which communities of people learn to ask questions and be skeptical and show examples of where someone tried something that didn't work um, or that got rejected, not because it was bad science, but because it was a complicated problem and as people were trying to figure out what to do, they tried various things until they came up with a reliable answer. Um, so I would say essentially your observation is correct. Unfortunately, yeah. more and more, but I think that the scientists don't get exposed to the fact that they have to talk about science. That, that is, that, that's a thing you didn't talk about, so I, I want yeah. to know what's... Uh, I think that's the purpose of today's lecture. <laughs> well, yes, part of, but, right. Today came only people that are yeah. really interested in this yeah. it wasn't published. Yeah. So I think it's something that we're um, both here, I mean, we have the same problem in the United States. So one of the things that happens is that sometimes you have to institutionalize ways of getting people to pay attention to communication. So what's happened, for example, in the United States is if you get a grant 
from the U.S. National Science Foundation, you are required to have an outreach component. You are expect you, you must have an explanation. It's called the broader impacts criterion. You have to show to get the grant. It has to be written into your proposal. How will you make your information available to a broader community? Which means, and so there are, in fact, I, the last email I looked at before I turned off my computer and walked in here was a seminar on how to communicate your, how to achieve your broader impacts criterion by communicating your science. So even people who don't want to or who are unaware of it, it becomes part of their professional um, uh, responsibility if they get funding uh, to do that. Yeah, I don't. I believe that the Israel Science Foundation does not now have such a requirement, but it could, and that would be some a way of of helping scientists learn that there's other things they could be doing, and when it, and when your funding depends on it, you'll learn about it. <laughs> no, it's not enough. There's many. I mean, there has to be a movement. There has to be discussion. One of the things that I've that's happened at Cornell, for example, I teach a course a weekend workshop for scientists on how to communicate. And the first year I offered that course, I asked the students who came, how did you hear about this course? Did you, did you see it on a poster or by, on an email? Um, did your professor tell you about it? And about half the hands in the room went up that their professor had told them about it. I said, and then how many of you are afraid that your professor will find out that you're here? And the other half of the hands. Right? So there is still this tension. In recent years, the last time I taught it, uh, a couple of months ago, the, everybody was on the, my, my professor told me about it side. There's a change over time. It does take time, but as more students have taken it and they tell other students and then those students become professors themselves, the culture will change. So it's, it's not going to change overnight. But if we take each of these different activities, we can get there. One of the things that seems to be quite different between what happens in the US and what happens in Israel on the journalist side mm -hmm. is that uh, there isn't a field of science journalism and there isn't an educated journalist uh, body in Israel who uh, has a scientific background and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it seems to be, when you do speak to the journalists, it's most cases, not all cases, <laughs> very rapid, it's just, and sometimes they make a very big difference. And I was curious as to what we could do to improve that side of things as well. Because I think it goes both, you need both sides to be willing to um, communicate in the middle of the a absolutely. Um, the journalists have to be committed to, to learning how to do this as well. In the, um, in the 20 years after World War II in the U.S., there was a strong movement to try to improve public understanding of science, almost fully supported, pushed by the scientific community. One of the things that they did with funding from the National Science Foundation was they started holding workshops not just for journalists, but for editors. They invited editors to come and learn about all of the great stories that they could get by covering science. Because that way they figured the editors would then put pressure on the journalists, you know, here's some good stories to, um, to cover. And then that led to then there were also workshops uh, for journalists uh, as well. There are still very few science journalism courses, or in, in the American sense of course, classes uh, in, um, uh, in science journalism. There are about a hundred people uh, who are members of the professional subgroup that, uh, where we teach science journalism classes and many of us teach only 20 or 30 students a year. It's still very small. Part of the problem is where the jobs are. There's, you know, there's because of the collapse of the media in the U.S. But when science journalists get together and talk about worldwide, there's a growth everywhere except the United States in the opportunities for science journalists. I'm going uh, a, a week and a half from now will be the World Conference of Science Journalists in Doha, Qatar, 
uh, and Qatar. And um, there, there's a lot of excitement about finding new ways to train journalists and scientists uh, in how to, uh, how to communicate. We actually will be having a workshop on developing a curriculum uh, for science journalism, uh, for journalism schools. So there are, t again, this is one more piece in the uh, attempt to build this. <laughs> so one is debating this question. So if we have the scientists and the journalists, we didn't talk about the public. Well, except from telling surveys that they really are interested in science, how do we know that they want more science? Why do we think they're interested? And can we do something to make them more interested? And the other one is um, concerning Qatar and Doha. Can you tell a little bit about trends in the world? And I understand that the Mm -hmm. So what's the, what's the reason for that change and can we do it here? Okay. Um, so the first question was a plant because um, the question of how can we possibly know about what the public is interested in. There's some article by someone named Baram Tsubari, I think, <laughs> um, which, you know, for example, looks at we can be, what we can begin to do is use, this is one of the places where the internet helps us, is we can begin to see not what kinds of stories do journalists produce, but what kinds of stories are people reading. So in the case of the article that Ayelet did, uh, they were looking at Google Trends and seeing how, what kinds of topics uh, people were clicking on and sources they were looking for uh, based on what was happening in the news. And it turns out that you can see a lot of science articles. Another former student of mine, Pablo Boczkowski, who's at Northwestern University, has looked, has compared the front pages of newspapers, the website front pages, with the most viewed and most emailed stories. So not, so what appears compared to what people actually click on. And there he's able to show that journalists put all the stories up about politics, but what people click on are the stories about other topics, in, including the science ones. He hasn't broken it down specifically by science, but journalists think that politics is more important than the public does, even in Israel. <laughs> um, and um, so I think that that's another way that we can begin to look at some studies to, to try to see that. Uh, you can, almost every time some kind of science uh, opportunity is presented, it gets overwhelmed by demand. Uh, Ronan Mir was telling me yesterday that the Mata Tech um, has gone from about 200,000 visitors a year to almost 500,000 visitors a year as they have changed their programming to make it more appealing uh, to people. Um, so that that, you know, there's, there's opportunities that way. Thinking about world trends, uh, there's a tremendous growth of science journalism in the developing world. And the reason for that is because while in the US I can be worried about the politics of science, in the developing world they are very concerned about taking the tools that science provides and using it to improve the quality of water and health care and food um, access. So that I, I had a slide up, I said scidev.net. That's a website devoted to helping science journalists around in developing countries identify good stories and good sources and good journalism techniques uh, for covering those stories, even if they don't have a science background. Uh, the Arab Science Journalists Association uh, is one of the fastest growing of the, of the science journalism associations. Uh, the meeting in Qatar, I think, is oversubscribed, even though it was so caught up, I mean, it was supposed to be in Cairo, and then things happened in Cairo, um, and the organizer there said, you know, I would like to have it in Cairo, but in the best of times, Egyptian bureaucracy is a little tough. Right now, I have no idea if we could even order food. Um, so we moved to Qatar. But, I mean, there's a huge amount of excitement um, about the meeting. The meeting has been happening every two years, somewhere around the world. Um, there's, so there's been a growth in meetings, so not only for the journalists, but the, um, 
the uh, World Congress of Science Centers, uh, science museums, they also meet somewhere around the world, usually every four years. They'll be meeting in September in Cape Town, South Africa. Um, again, a very, um, they have a growing meeting. There's a group that, by that label that I used, Public Communication of Science and Technology, we meet someplace every two years. We were last December in India. Next uh, April, we'll be in Florence, Italy. Um, another development. Yeah, that one's not so much developing, but, but the India part was important, that we, we met in India in part because we have also met in South Africa, uh, in Brazil, uh, no, no, in, um, where did we meet? Between, with South Africa, India, there's one other developing country. What? Beijing. Beijing, we've had a meeting in, um, and we'll be meeting in Brazil uh, in a few years um, because of the excitement there. Any other questions? No? So I would like to thank you very much. Thank you.